Okay, 17.2, uh, this is line integrals. We're gonna be integrating um, functions over curves. So this can be done in, in two variables, three variables, any number of variables. We're gonna focus on two variables just because uh, we can draw pictures a lot easier as usual. Uh, so we have a two variable function. Um, we have, so its domain is X and Y. So here's the domain. Um, so the inputs are pairs of points. Now, instead of, uh, so in the last uh, chapter, we did a lot of integration where we integrated this function over regions on our domain. So for example, we might've integrated over this region here. All right. So today, instead of doing a region, we're gonna be integrating over a curve in the domain. So for example, maybe uh, this curve right there. Okay, so I'm going to give this name, uh, give this curve the name C, and we're going to be integrating the function over this domain. All right, so our notation is going to be integral f ds c. So this is the uh, curve that we're integrating over. Um, ds references the fact that this is a one variable, uh, one. Uh, let me write it as one dimensional integral. All right, because we're integrating over the curve. Okay, um, let me draw a uh, kind of 3D picture. So including the graph of F, so X, Y, Z. So if this is the graph of F, what we're doing is um, here's our curve on the ground. We go all the way up until we hit our graph. And then we uh, do this at every point above the curve. Let me make this picture a little bigger. We do this at every point above the curve. And what we end up with um, is kind of like a curtain here. All right, so our integral is um, the area of this curtain. All right, area of the curtain. Okay. All right, so that's kind of physically uh, what we would be calculating um, or what we're gonna wanna calculate in this, uh, in this section. Okay, so there's our curve. And again, this is the graph of F. Okay, um, notation. This is, um, let me rewrite it down here, is a, a line integral. So that's what we call this kind of integral. Uh, line refers to the fact that we're doing a uh, kind of, again, a one variable or a one dimensional integral. Um, we Again, we only want the area above this curve, right? Uh, we don't care about what's going on here. We don't care about what's going on there. We don't care about what's going on there. Okay, so you can see this is a this is a one variable calculus integral. Um, in that, in one variable calculus, we're calculating areas, right? And here, uh, this curtain has an area, as opposed to, for example, a volume or something like that, which is what we would be we would have been doing um, in chapter sixteen, right? If we had a two variable calculus, two variable function, we were integrating over a domain like this or a region like this, and in that case, we were calculating volumes under the graph, all right? So this is area here. All right, um, so this picture is all two variable, of course, but um, we can do exactly the same thing in any dimensions. If you have a function of uh, three variables, right? Then again, this is the domain picture, x, y, z. Um, so this picture here is analogous to our picture up here. Um, this one up here. Okay. All right. So we would have a curve in the domain, for, uh, perhaps something like this. And we would be integrating uh, f ds again still. Um, this is still a one variable calculus uh, or, or one dimensional integral because we still only care about what's happening above only this curve. And the curve is one, one dimensional. Okay. Um, in this case, we're not going to be able to draw the picture analogous to this curtain picture up here. Uh, because we would need an, one extra dimension, all right? But the idea is, is still the same. This is still a line integral, um, despite the fact that now we're, in a way, we're working in three dimensions, right? We're still integrating over a curve. That's the important uh, feature here. Okay, how do we integrate this? How do we actually do this? Um, how do we compute this? All right, so one idea, the idea that's closest to our, our kind of definition of this um, whole concept is, well, if we have a curve like this, um, 
and here's our curtain. And I'm not going to draw the rest of the graph of f. Uh, one idea is we can um, we can chop this region into equal size uh, or chop our, our sorry chop our curve into equal size intervals, and then we uh, go all the way up vertically until we hit our graph, and then we've got a rectangle, right? Area of the rectangle easy to compute, right? You can do this with the next uh, interval here. Area of that. Uh, rectangle, easy to compute. You do this for each segment um, and you add up all the uh, areas of these rectangles. So again, pretty much literally the, the kind of standard definition of um, integration, right? Add these all up and you get um, an approximation for the area of the curtain. As your segments here get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? The, the sums of these areas uh, of these rectangles in the limit go to the area of the curtain, the actual area of the curtain that we're looking for, the actual integral of f over c. Okay. All right. Now, of course, in practice, you're not going to be able to do this because in practice, you know, these are not going to be physical quantities where you can measure things. Um, they're going to be in terms of formulas. Uh, so how do we actually do this? Well, in practice, what we do is we're going to port the entire problem to one variable calculus, and then we'll just do um, an integral in one variable calculus. All right. So how do we do that? Well, we, we do a parameterization of our curve. So let me kind of draw it like this. Um, let me draw three pictures. So this first picture here is, um, is t. All right, so t is our variable. Um, this is going to be the, para the, the parameter for our um, parameterization. Uh, here is the second picture is the domain of our function. And so here's our curve, let's say. All right, so r of t here um, is a parameterization of this curve, where, for example, let's say um, this point here goes to the left endpoint, and this point here goes to this uh, endpoint on the right. Let's say we're traveling in this direction. The travel direction doesn't doesn't isn't as relevant isn't relevant at the moment. Okay. Um, now from here we can continue this and uh, um, plug in uh, points into f, right? F of x comma comma oops comma y. All right. So here the picture would be. Uh, let me draw the full three D picture in this case. So there's our curtain, right? So let's let's trace one point, right? So let's say this point here, that would go to some point on the curve, right? That in this third picture would be, let's say, um, I'm going from, sorry, I'm going from there to there. Let me draw the arrow just to keep things consistent, okay? And uh, it goes to, it's the same as this point here. And then finally, when we actually apply the F, that's our value, okay? So this uh, kind of ports the function um, from uh, this 3D picture, in a way, to a picture up here in terms of just t, right? So for example, if this height right here happened to be, let's say, 10, then the value above here would be 10, all right? So we can do this at every single uh, point in t, right? Port, the, port it forward to here which corresponds literally to some point on this in this uh, picture, the third picture. And then we go all the way up until we hit the curtain. We calculate how high that is, and we get a value above um, uh, at that height in our, in our one variable picture, all right? So ultimately what happens is we get a curve up here in our one variable picture, which represents um, f, okay? Um, and now if you think about it, this is literally f of x of t comma y of t. That same guy that we talked about way back when we first started talking about derivatives, um, the directional derivatives, um, the entire concept of derivatives in, uh, in one variable calculus. All right. So it's, it's literally this function here, right? Because this is a composition. You're doing x of t comma y of t first, which is this r of t. And then you're applying f to it, which is this uh, third picture going upstairs from the ground. All right. Okay. Now, 
um, your first thought might be that, well, now that we've ported the function backwards, um, we can just calculate the area of this um, uh, region up here in the, in the T space, right, in the T variable space. Uh, and uh, perhaps that's the integral that we're looking for. That's the area of the actual curtain um, that, we're, that we want. But it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, and the reason is, well, we kind of know the reason already. Uh, we saw it in the uh, change of coordinates uh, discussion. The reason is that um, if, we, if we do integrate just naively over this um, one variable uh, calculus problem on this left here, we chop this guy up into rectangles like this, let's say, into rectangles like this, right? That's what you would be doing if you, if you did the, uh, just purely the one variable calculus integral of this ported back function, all right? Or of this um, composition function. Uh, the problem with that is that when you do these kind of equal space rectangles here, um, what happens on the right-hand side? Or let's say this intermediate picture. Well, um, equal sized markings in this uh, T-space here are, aren't necessarily equal space mar markings um, on the curve, right? So um, in terms of this parameterization, we remember that you can have parameterizations that speed up or slow down, right? So these equal space notches on the left-hand side here represent, for example, in terms of time, equal time intervals. But if you're speeding up or slowing down, you're um, you're driving to different positions at those times. And that's what it rep that's the representation on the right-hand side here, okay? So ultimately down here in the very last picture, we have these unequally spaced intervals. Um, and so if we, if we calculate these, uh, each of these rectangles up here correspond to, or should correspond to a rectangle here, right? But because these are unequally spaced, we're not actually calculating the areas correctly, the area of our actual curtain. Right? So for example, um, let me do one of these. So let's say this middle curtain right here, or this middle uh, rectangle right here. On this, in this T picture, it's very thin, right? However, let's say this point here and that point there go to that point there and that point there, where it's really wide apart, right? So that corresponds to, in our third picture, that point there and that point there. Okay, so what happens is if you look at the rectangle above those two points in our final picture, you actually have a very fat rectangle, right? So um, the fat rectangle, in a way, is what you're, what um, is a misleading uh, calculation of your area because remember, the way you're supposed to be calculating this is you you want to be doing equal notches, right? If you don't do equal notches um, and you take the limit uh, as the uh, notches go to, the size of notches go to zero, there could be problems in terms of the, the calculation. You're not going to get the actual area, right? And so here, because your notches aren't equal, you have this fat rectangle here, which you've calculated in a way as a thin rectangle, all right? So roughly that idea. Um, if you think back to our discussion on change of coordinates, this is, was exactly the problem in change of coordinates, right? Um, the rectangles in our kind of, or, or in those cases, rectangular boxes, uh, when we were doing change of coordinates um, in three variables, um, didn't correspond correctly to the actual rectangular boxes that we were working with, all right? So we need a compensation factor. And what is that compensation factor? Well, lucky for us, uh, it's pretty much the same idea. Um, the idea is that if this is um, this size here is delta t, right? Then this size here is actually very is actually roughly um, dr dt length of that delta t. Okay. All right, uh, if you think about this in terms of um, motion, right? This is saying if you travel for time delta t, uh, on this second picture here, how far are you traveling, right? So the, the, um, the distance between uh, the, uh, the kind of, uh, yeah, the distance from here to here, right, that you've traveled is roughly um, the time it took to travel, delta t, 
times your speed of travel, which is exactly this drdt, uh, length of drdt here, all right? So speed times length is your distance, right? And so that's exactly, um, well, as, as delta t goes to zero, your, uh, your distance uh, of that curve right there, okay? All right, so that means that this rectangle down here, the base of this rectangle in the third picture um, is dr dt, length of that delta t. Okay. Or again, uh, that this is an approximation of that. And so if we actually wanted to um, do an integral in the t space, right, instead of an integral, um, instead of an integral directly in, 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 three in, in the two variable uh, world, which we can't do, what we need to do is we need to do an integral dt, and then we have our compensation factor, right? This is actually literally the, the Jacobian um, in, the, in, in a way in the one variable case. So dr dt, that's our compens compensation factor, right? So this is the width of our rectangle, and then f of x of t comma y of t, that's the height of our rectangle, all right? So in a way, we can do this correspondence here. Um, this thing here corresponds to that height right there. And this guy here corresponds to that base right there, okay? All right, um, what is our, uh, so this is, this. so notice that in here, um, this is a one variable calculus integral. Everything here has been converted to T, right? Um, your F, whatever it was in terms of X and Y, are now con converted to T through the X of T and Y of T. DR DT is something that's purely in terms of T um, because we've taken the, uh, the length here of this vector. DT, well, that's T. And then the limits of integration are gonna be whatever our endpoints correspond to, all right? So for example, if, um, if this left endpoint here were t equals uh, little a, and this was uh, t equals little b, and that mapped to there and there, right, which is in this picture there and there, there, sorry, then we would be integrating from a to b, t equals a to t equals b, okay? All right, so this is how we calculate um, the line integral. So this is equal to integral f d s, uh, C. All right. Now, one caveat uh, that you need to be careful about, of course, you need this uh, parameterization to be one-to-one, uh, -one, right? If, for example, your, um, your uh, parameterization kind of repeats itself or goes backwards along the curve, right? So if your parameterization goes like this and it maps to your curve here, but then goes backwards a little bit and then comes forwards again, then you're going to be calculating the wrong area. Right? You'd be calculating kind of uh, too much of the curtain in a way, all right, or uh, too much curtain. Okay, so at this point, um, we're almost all set for, um, for line integrals because now you can just calculate, given any um, curve and any function, you should be able to calculate uh, the line integral, a line integral. So let's do a... Um, Let's do an example that works out very well. Uh, so let's uh, calculate integral cxy squared ds. So this is a line integral. Our function is xy squared, uh, where let's say c is the part of the circle uh, about the origin. Let's say radius um, two. Uh, part of the circle about the origin, uh, radius two, that's in the, let's say, second quadrant. Okay, so in this picture, we would be looking at that portion right there. All right, so we would be calculating a curtain, the area of a curtain above this uh, quarter circle. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, we just take the parameter, we, we take a parameterization. So R of T um, equals, uh, so this is where kind of this vector uh, valued functions is really bad notation, right? Because we're, we're not really thinking of these, these things as, um, as vectors, right? So um, 
that's why I said in the very beginning that I didn't like the vector valued function uh, concept um, at all. But um, it's it's pretty uh, standard to be using this notation, so we'll we'll use it. Okay, so we need we need a, a parameterization that represents um, this quarter circle, and so by now hopefully we're used to using this guy here. We are radius two, so I'm gonna put a two there. Right, so that's gonna be our parameterization. We're interested only in the part that's in the second quadrant, so we're only interested in t between. Uh, pi over 2, so that would be here, right, and then um, pi, so that would be here. So we're actually doing a parameterization that travels in that direction. Um, at this moment, travel direction is irrelevant, all right? Okay, but we will care about it in, in just a few minutes. Okay, um, so what is our integral? So f ds over c is, uh, well, integral, let's just... Um, uh, use our formula. So this was a to b, and we're going from pi over 2 to pi, so pi over 2 to pi. Our function f of x of t, y of t, right? We'll do that in one second. And then the important kind of compensation factor is r prime of t, and then dt. Okay, so what is r prime of t? Well, uh, x prime of t is uh, minus 2 sine t, y prime of t is 2 sine t, and so r prime of t, length of that is 2, all right? And so uh, f of, uh, so, so let me write this here, f of x of t, y of t, our function was x, y squared. Um, x of t is 2 cos t, so this would be, um, the x converts to 2 cos t. The y converts to 2 sine t. We square it because our function is xy squared. Uh, our prime of t is just 2 in this case, and then dt. All right. So ultimately, um, the area of this curtain or the this line integral here that we want is going to be uh, 4, 16, uh, cos t sine squared t, dt. All right. And the entire point here is that this is purely one variable calculus. Okay, so we've reduced the problem to one variable calculus, and so let, let's call it easy in quotes, all right, in that we, uh, we theoretically know how to do this. Okay, um, as usual, uh, these integrals, um, we, we've been talking about them as areas of curtains, but of course, if you have portions of your function below the um, xy plane, then these integrals can be negative, right? Just as in one variable calculus, when you have parts of your function below the, uh, the x-axis, you, you can have um, areas canceling out. So this is exactly the same uh, situation here. Uh, let's see, for this particular integral, that this is, looks like it's going to become sine cubed. Um, sine is positive from uh, pi over 2 to pi, so it looks like this guy is going to be a positive number here. All right. Okay, now, this example worked out really, really well, um, especially because r prime was nice and simple. In fact, this was a constant speed parameterization, right? Uh, this parameterization represented motion along the circle at a constant speed of two. Um, let's do a, a kind of maybe a more typical example uh, where we can see um, that this r prime of t often gives us trouble. Um, which in a way you already know because um, the arc length parameterization section, uh, when you try to find arc length parameterizations, it was often difficult because of this integral of, um, uh, because you had to integrate the uh, r prime of t, the length of r prime of t, which involved uh, a square root. And so often it was, uh, it was, it was difficult to actually compute. Um, so we see the same problem here. So let's integrate, um, this guy here, where c is equal to part of y equals x squared, uh, let me write the part of y equals x squared between 1, 1, and uh, let's say 3, 9. All right, so in terms of the picture, we're interested in, um, so a part of a parabola, y equals x squared, between 1, 1, 
and 3 comma 9. Okay, so we're interested in finding the curtain of our function above this guy right there. All right. Okay, so again, um, we need a parameterization. And the one we're going to use, the easiest parameterization for these kinds of uh, curves is just t comma t squared. All right. Um, what t are we interested in? Um, 1 comma 1 to 3 comma 9. So that means x equals 1 to, uh, to x equals 3. And uh, the role of x is essentially played by t in this particular um, parameterization. So we can easily see that t should go from 1 to 3. Okay. All right. So that means r prime of t, uh, length of that is going to be square root. Um, so r of t, r prime, this is going to be a 1 squared plus 2t squared, like that. All right. And so that's actually equal to 1 plus 4t squared. Okay. Okay. So our actual line integral, the one that we're looking for, is equal to, once we've ported it to one variable calculus, t equals 1 to 3, um, xy squared. So x is t y is uh, t squared, and so this y squared is t to the fourth, oops. Uh, let me write it as t squared, that's y, and then squared, right? And then square root, 1 plus 4t squared dt. Okay, so ultimately you're going to have to integrate 1 to 3, t to the um, 5, square root, 1 plus 4t squared dt. Okay. All right, and I'm going to write easy in quotes again, but what I mean is that this is now, we've, we've converted a, a multivariable calculus problem into a one-variable calculus problem. All right, so um, at this point, you would, you would just have to use whatever one-variable calculus techniques you can to solve this. All right, um, what about uh, curves in the plane? Uh, same idea. Okay, so integral c f of x, y, z, dz, ds, right, almost pretty much the same notation because, again, we're, we're just integrating over a curve, is equal to, same idea, f of x of t, you just parameterize it, y of t, z of t, right, um, and then you have r prime of t, length of that, dt, all right, t equals the start of the curve, t equals the end of the curve, okay, so um, same idea, except, of course, you have this extra z term, which makes things a little, um, a little messy. Okay, one note. Um, if your parameterization was an arc length parameterization, right, then you're in luck because then what does that mean? Um, that means our, the whole, the entire meaning of arc length parameterization is that your speed is one. All right, so in that case, the integral, the line integral, f ds, is actually just t equals a, t equals b, f of x of t, y of t, and then the compensation factor is just 1 dt. All right. So this is one thing that's really, really nice about um, arc length parameterizations. So this is a situation where kind of our um, naive picture all the way upstairs, um, let me go all the way up, our naive picture up here when we talked about this, uh, this picture here, it actually works because there are no fat rectangles. Because when you have an arc length parameterization, um, every unit of time corresponds to a unit of distance. So your rectangles are actually all the same width. And so the, the naive integral actually turns out to be exactly the integral that, that we want. Okay, um, now let's, get, let's, let's make things more interesting. Um, line integrals. Um, of vector fields. So just now, what we talked about was integrals uh, of a function, little f, right? But now what we're starting out is we don't have a function, okay? So again, let, let me uh, do this. Uh, this can be done in, in any number of variables, but again, let's, uh, let's work with two variables. Let's say we have a vector field, capital F, all right? And... Um, let me draw it like this.
Okay, now um, in this setting, let's say we have a curve. Um, let me do it like this. From here, uh, let me let me kind of keep it consistent with my other pictures. So let's do a curve like from here to here. All right. Now in this particular situation, we have a direction. All right. Okay. Um, the direction is actually really important here. So the idea is uh, we want to know, so we can think of this um, situation in two ways. So one is, this is a force field. And what we want to know is, um, well, one thing we've actually worked with in the past, let me draw kind of a, a mini picture here. So this is our curve. Let me do it in the same color. This is our curve. Uh, this is a, um, this is uh, 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 one of the vectors on our vector field on the curve, all right? Uh, one thing we looked at way, way back was uh, the concept of work, right? So if this vector field F um, represents a force field, right? And this uh, curve represents kind of um, motion, let's say of a particle in this force field, right? Um, then we can talk about the work done by this force as the particle moves along this curve, right? And we said that um, in this setup, the, uh, the force vector has two components. One component is tangent to um, our direction of motion, and the other component is perpendicular to our direction of motion, right? Well, when we talk about work, um, as we move along, um, let's say a curve here, uh, the, the part of the force that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, that's in a way doing nothing, right? So this guy is doing nothing, in quotes. Uh, doing nothing um, when it comes to this particle moving along this curve, all right? So um, this force is only kind of in a way pushing the particle, um, or, or the, the relevant part of the force that's pushing the particle is only the part that's tangent to the um, to the uh, to the curve. All right. So this is this is the um, part of the uh, uh, force that we care about when it comes to the concept of work. All right. Okay. Um, so what is that vector? Well, that vector is, or or what is the length of that vector? The length of that vector is f dot t where t is the unit tangent to the curve um, in the direction of motion. Okay, so direction of motion is really important here when we think about this because, of course, um, if we move in one direction, we get a certain amount of work, but if we do the exact opposite direction, we're gonna get a negative work, it should be negative. Okay, um, so for this, uh, for line integral vector fields, again, the direction ex matters very, very importantly. Okay, all right, so um, the amount of work that matters is exactly this uh, f dot t right there. Okay, now we want to know the total work done by this force as this particle moves along this curve. Uh, from the start point to the end point, right? That means we need to, in a way, add up all these work or all the work at each point, right? So we have the work um, at this point that we've just looked at. We have the work at this point here, at this point here, at this point here, at every point along the curve, all right? If we add up all that work, we get the total work done, right? So let me write this as total work done. Is going to be adding up all these, but what is adding up? Um, that's integration, all right? So that's going to be integral C F dot T DS, all right? C is in the direction of, uh, let me write it as um, uh, C has direction. Let me just emphasize that, okay? As opposed to, again, the pre our previous uh, section or mini section where it didn't matter. So one thing you'll notice back here, if you look at the examples that we did, if you if I do a parameterization that's backwards, um, the answer would still be the same, 
all right? But now the answer is not gonna be the same because if I parameterize backwards, I'm gonna pop out a minus sign right there at the f dot t because I'm, I'm going in the opposite direction. So my dot product is gonna be the opposite sign, all right? Or let me, um, maybe it's a better way to emphasize that the has, sorry, I shouldn't have erased the whole thing. Let me emphasize the has direction, sorry, just to make it a little more accurate. The has direction is, is um, you see it in the T, you see it in the T, all right? Okay, because again, in this picture up here, the direction is uh, given by the, uh, the, um, the unit tangent here, right? Uh, tangent to the curve in the direction of motion, all right? So I shouldn't have put the arrow uh, on the C. It, the direction is literally shown to us in the T. Okay. All right. So what is this? This is literally a line integral, right? Once I've taken f dot T, that's a function, right? There's no more vectors in this problem, in this expression here. All right. So this is just a line integral. And we can do this problem just as we did any problem um, uh, from above. All right. So now just a regular line in tool. This is why I kind of wanted to get rid of the arrow to the C, because when you calculate this thing right here now, you can do any parameterization you like, um, but um, if you do a backwards parameterization, you have to remember that your direction T was wrong, and you have to put a negative sign in front of your answer. All right, so obviously the most uh, convenient thing to do is just find a parameterization that's in the same direction um, that you're interested in, all right? But you do have this flexibility. All right, so that's it. Um, this is a uh, line integral um, of the vector field, all right? Uh, another kind of interpretation, so we talked about this in terms of work. Another interpretation is maybe to think of the vector field as a, uh, like a flow of liquid, right? Like maybe this is a river, um, and um, the curve is maybe your motion in this river, right? You're on a boat, your motion in the river, okay? So um, the f dot t would be um, the flow of the water in your direction, right? And then the opposite, the kind of perpendicular direction is kind of irrelevant in terms of, in a way, in terms of your, your direction of motion, okay? So this is in a way measuring the flow of water along this curve, all right? Okay, now, the good news about these computations is that um, we're very lucky because if you write out this f dot tds, you're gonna see something really, really nice. So let's, let's compute. All right, so how do we compute this? Again, we find a parameterization, um, x of t, y of t, right? Um, we calculate its uh, speed. And again, let's, let's assume that um, this parameterization is in the correct direction of motion, so we don't have to pop out a minus sign, all right? Um, then what exactly is, is this quantity, f dot, t d, f dot t here? Well, what is t? t is equal to the unit tangent in the direction of motion, right? Again, our prime we're assuming is in the direction of motion. We want a unit tangent. So the direction of motion is r prime of t. To make it unit, we divide by its length, all right? Okay, so integral c f dot t ds actually turns out to be integral t equals a to b, right, under this parameterization, f, dot r prime of t over length of r prime of t, okay? And then the ds becomes r prime of t dt, right? That's our, our kind of substitution or, or, or uh, compensation, whatever way you want to think of it. And now you'll see something really nice. r prime of t cancels with r prime of t, all right? Always. And so ultimately, our integral is really, really simple. It's just a to b f dot r prime of t dt, all right? So you don't actually, in practice, when you compute this, you don't actually need to calculate this um, r prime of t. You don't have to calculate the absolute value of the r prime of t. And so you don't actually pop out any square roots. And so oftentimes these integrals are, are 
much more straightforward than, for example, the, the examples we uh, did above. All right. Okay, let me actually continue this computation. Um, because from here, uh, so this is this is actually all you need to know in terms of computation, all right? Uh, if you do want to calculate the uh, line integral um, of a vector field, this is what you get, all right? This is how you would in practice compute it. Uh, should you memorize this? Hopefully you'll do enough problems that it'll automatically be committed to uh, memory. But um, if not, I personally never memorize these formulas. Um, I just re I just memorize or remember that this guy here represents the work, or this guy here represents the um, uh, the line integral of the vector field, right? And then I can always do this uh, subsequent calculation separately or um, from there, and then I, I know the formula. Uh, this way, I only have to rep kind of remember how to integrate line integrals in general, right? Line integral of a function, right? Because again, this f dot t is just a function. And so less things to memorize. Okay, in any case, let's continue this computation because from here we get some um, notation. Uh, so this is a to b, and let me say f is um, the vector field uh, given by f comma g. All right. Uh, let me uh, kind of um, emphasize this is f of x comma y, g of x comma y, because it's a vector field living in a plane. Okay, so um, what would this f dot r prime of t look like? Well, it would be f uh, comma g, um, f of x of t comma y of t, and so on, right, um, uh, in actuality. And then dot, what's r prime of t? r prime of t is x prime comma y prime dt, all right? So this integral actually is integral from a to b, f x prime dot uh, plus, um, g y prime dt. Okay. All right, let me rewrite this. This is a to b f dx dt plus g dy dt and then a the whole thing dt. All right. Okay, um, nothing has happened, nothing interesting has happened. Uh, but now here's a, a bit of notation. So it looks like, right, we have a t above here and t below here and t below here. So in terms of notation, we often write, and I, I personally hate this notation because it's really confusing for, for people, uh, especially when you're first learning this, but um, this is an, it's a very, very uh, common uh, notation for line integral. So f dx plus g dy. All right, so this is an alternate notation for integral f dot t ds. All right, so this is a notation. Let me write alternate notation for, for this guy here. Okay, purely notation because, um, for example, if you think about this, f dx doesn't even make sense. Right, everything here is actually in terms of t, and you're actually integrating in terms of t. GDY doesn't really make sense. Everything is in terms of t, and you're integrating with respect to t. All right, so this is 100% purely notation. Right, it's it's notation uh, very much in the way that remember the chain rule all the way back in um, one variable calculus. If you do df dx, and let's say y depends on x, right, is equal to df dy dy dx and you, um, you kind of remember it as these guys canceling, right? Li nothing is actually literally canceling. Um, it's just a, this thing here was just a way to remember um, the chain rule. And in a way it's similar here. This is 100% notation, all right? Okay, but it's super popular, so you'll see this notation all over the place. Um, you'll definitely see it in the future. So if you do see f dx plus g dy or something dx plus something dy, an integral that's from a to b, like just a, a, a one variable integral, then that's actually representing um, this guy down here. Okay. Now, if, um, if you're doing a three variable thing, the three variable version would be a to b, f dx plus g dy, or whatever dx plus whatever dy plus, and then something dz. 
Okay, and again, that's purely notation for this guy here. All right, the right-hand side is really what you're doing. All right, one more bit of notation, which is um, not as kind of terrible. Um, if we go back, actually, if we go back to, let me let me go back. So uh, let me write f dot t d s um, over c. This is um, f dot uh, r prime. Let me write this as dr dt. Um, dt, right? We said that this is actually how you compute uh, before we did this, this other notation stuff. Um, so here's another bit of notation. These guys here, these two together, right? It looks like the dt's and the dt's cancel. So oftentimes a bit of notation that's used is um, f dot dr, all right? So this dr here represents the dr dt dt, okay? 100% notation, and it is 100% purely just alternate alternative notation for, for that expression right there. Okay, so that is uh, integration of vector fields. Next, we're gonna talk about two particular um, kinds of this integration um, on a vector field that we're really, really interested in, that we will be interested in in the next few, um, well, from now to the end of the, uh, end of the class, actually. Okay, so this would be circulation. and flux. All right, for this, um, we're going to start with circulation. We're interested in a closed, smooth, well, for both of these, we, we're interested in closed, smooth, oriented curves. All right, so closed means that it closes up on itself, like that, all right? Um, its, its start point is, its, is the same as its end point. And for, for now, um, there, it's allowed to cross itself, all right? Um, smooth means that um, it's, not, it's not like this. There's no kinks, there's no terribleness like that, um, because if the underlying math actually depends on that, all right? Um, we are not so concerned about it in our class, but um, if you wanna make all of this mathematically rigorous, you actually seriously need to consider that. But again, we're only gonna work with relatively nice things. When in our class, you do not, sometimes we won't have smooth curves, right? So occasionally we'll look at something like this, right? So the curve maybe that goes like from here to here and then around and then back, all right? This is not smooth because there's problems at this point and this point. So what we do is we just break it into two problems. We work this problem, the, the flat part, the horizontal part, and then we work the circular part separately, all right? And that's, that's the reason why we have to do that well. One reason is because they have completely different formulas, but the second reason is that um, because of the, the corners, all right? Okay, so closed, smooth, um, oriented means there's a direction, right? So when you have a, um, uh, a curve, uh, you always can have a direction of motion, right? Just like what we talked about just now. So this curve here could be oriented in this direction. So for this first curve, we can actually use the words um, counterclockwise, right? Or you could, uh, talk about it being oriented clockwise, all right? So in this section, we don't just draw a picture of a curve, right? We draw a picture of a curve and we attach an arrow to it to indicate um, the direction, all right? So this one, I didn't finish the picture like that, all right? Okay, so um, these are the kind of things we're working with in this mini section, all right? And again, for circulation, um, the curve can intersect itself for now, but not for, for the flux. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, so what is circulation? Oops. So luckily for us, super simple. Um, circulation um, of F along C. Uh, let's, let me just draw a picture. Let's say this is my curve, C, all right? What is that? Uh, C is a closed curve, closed, smooth, oriented curve, all right? So this is equal to integral f dot t ds, C, all right? Where t is 
uh, what is this t? t is the direction given by the orientation. All right. So you 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 want t to to be uh, pointing, for example, uh, this way if your curve is um, uh, oriented in a way counterclockwise. So your t has to be like that. Okay. All right. So circulation is super simple. It's literally what we've been doing um, uh, the whole time with uh, integrating vector fields. Uh, what does it mean? Um, it is calculating how much uh, liquid, so liquid is maybe the, um, the easier kind of visual analogy, how much liquid is moving around uh, this circular path. All right. And again, it's f dot tds because we don't care about liquid that's moving perpendicular to to the um, uh, curve, all right? Okay, this is gonna be really, really important for us um, in the future, in future sections. All right, so uh, I'm not gonna do any examples here because literally we know how to calculate this, but uh, let's do kind of a small picture thing. So if I have a vector field that looks maybe something like, um, something like this, right? And my, um, my curve is something like that. And let's say it's oriented in this direction. All right. Then just looking at this picture, it looks like the circulation is going to be positive. All right. Because as I move along this curve, like for example, right there, it looks like F dot T. I'm sorry. It looks like F is in the same direction as T. Right. So my F dot T is going to be a positive number. Right, and it's going to be true pretty much, uh, you know, as far as we can tell from this picture. Right, f is in this direction, t is in that direction, so f dot t is going to be positive. F is in that direction, roughly, t is in that direction, positive. F in this direction, t is in that direction, positive. Okay, so it looks like in this picture that f dot t is going to be ds is going to be positive, so the circulation is going to be a positive number. All right, and notice that what's happening here is our vector field is kind of circling around uh, um, clockwise here, right? So uh, this circulation concept does tell you something about um, uh, kind of liquid flowing around in a circle, okay? Now, if we had oriented this curve in the opposite direction, in the counterclockwise direction, our number answer would be the same but negative. Okay. All right. Again, super, super important. And notice one thing here. This works in any dimension. So this concept um, works in any dimension. All right. So I could have a curve, a closed oriented curve um, in R3. Uh, let me draw a plane. Uh, sorry, a space. All right. Closed up like this. I have an orientation, right? I have a vector field, a three-dimensional vector field. I can calculate the circulation, all right? It's perfectly legit. All right, so our next concept is the flux. So this is uh, only in R2, at least for now. Um, we'll be talking about kind of an extension of this in the near future. So this is the flux, only in R2. Um, and in this case, we're talking about closed smooth, oriented, so same three as, as just now, um, curves that don't intersect themselves. All right, so um, in the previous uh, situation with um, circulation, it didn't matter if the curve intersect itself. You can still do the integral, makes perfect sense. In this situation, we're not allowed to have curves that intersect itself. So only curves that, for example, look like that. But again, we always want to attach a direction. So that's my direction in this case, for example. All right? Because again, the word oriented is important. Uh, just like before, right? Just like the previous section. If you orient in a different direction, you'll get a different, you'll get a negative of the, of, uh, the actual answer. Okay, why don't we want things that intersect themselves in this section? Well, the idea is we care about, um, what we actually care about is not the curve itself. What we care about is this region here versus the outside, all right? So when you have a closed, smooth, oriented curve that doesn't intersect itself, there's an in, there's the concept of an inside, and let me put that in quotes, and an outside, 
all right? And flux is about the inside and the outside, all right? Um, very, um, in terms of words, uh, what we're gonna be calculating is if we have a vector field in this setting, let's say I have a vector field um, like this, Right? What I'm going to be calculating is essentially how much uh, liquid is moving from the inside of this region to the outside of the region. All right. Overall, of course, if there's liquid moving in, it cancels with liquid moving out. All right. So um, that's going to be the idea. That's the idea behind flux. All right. And the liquid analogy, I think, is probably uh, a very maybe the most um, approachable or accessible one. All right. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Let's go into the um, kind of details. So again, we have a, uh, a curve, closed, oriented. Now, um, because it's oriented, there's a direction, right? Um, uh, that we can we can talk about at every point, right? We can talk about this direction, right? This point, we talk about that direction, right? Because we're oriented like this, and it's always gonna it has to be consistent, all right? So in this for this particular picture, the word would be counterclockwise is my direction. That would be a nice description. Okay, so let me call this direction capital T, right? Because it's tangent to our um, curve. Uh, so this induces, so th given a direction along the curve, we can define a normal direction. The normal direction, or let me write a normal direction, N, all right? So what's the idea here? Any, at any point here, there's two normal directions. There's the one in that direction and there's one in this direction, all right? We want to kind of say that if a curve is oriented, if there's a direction counterclockwise, then going with it is a set um, concept of the normal, all right? We, we want to kind of get rid of this ambiguity of this inward normal or this outward normal, okay? So if you give me a direction for the curve, then I'm going to I'm going to set either inside inward normal or outward outward normal, okay? I'm going to choose either to always work with the inward normal or always work with the outward normal, all right? And that um, direction, either the inward or the outward, is determined by t cross k, all right? Where k is the z direction. So like I said, we only are working in the plane, but um, of course the plane x y plane lives in space. So we just kind of, ex for the purposes of this normal, we extend our picture to space. Um, but in reality, things are actually just working in the plane. All right. Okay, so T cross K. All right. Um, so here you do the right-hand uh, right rule. K points um, in this particular picture, K, K points, uh, let's say, outwards towards um, out of the screen, right? If we do T cross K in this particular example with this particular T, that's gonna be my normal, all right? So again, all we've chosen is actually this direction of the normal as opposed to the opposite direction, okay? And this T cross K is essentially telling us um, in words, if I have an orientation for my curve that's counterclockwise, then the normal is pointing outwards, all right? If I choose had chosen an orientation that was clockwise, then my normal would be inwards, all right? Okay, so that's the, the gist of it. All right, so let me let me actually write that down. Clockwise, normal is inwards. Counterclockwise, normal is outwards. And usually we want to talk about the outwards normal. So usually we're going to want counterclockwise um, uh, orientations for our curve, all right? By the way, notice uh, this is only, um, we're, we said this was only in R2 because um, a curve in R2 does delineate between the inside and outside, a closed curve, right? That doesn't intersect itself. But a closed curve in space does not create an inside and an outside. So that's why we're not doing space in this particular example. Okay, so, um, this flux is going to measure um, how much liquid is flowing 
uh, again, given a vector field that represents liquid flow, for example, how much liquid is flowing um, in the direction of the induced normal given our orientation for the curve, all right? So in this first picture up here, when we talk about the, the flux in one second, it's gonna be measuring how much liquid is flowing out of the region. And for the second picture where we pick the opposite orientation, we're gonna be measuring how much liquid is flowing into our region. And the answers are always gonna be negatives of each other, all right? Okay, so let's actually um, write down the formula. So the flux is C ds, so it's just a line integral, but the inside function that we integrate is f dot n ds. All right, so instead of f dot t ds, now it's f dot n ds. And you can see it makes sense, my description of how much liquid is flowing out of the region makes sense because um, when we dot with the n, right, we're measuring how much of f is in the same direction as n. And when n points outwards, we're measuring how much of f is pointing outwards. When n points inwards, we're measuring how much of f points inwards, so how much liquid is flowing inwards. Okay, um, so that's it. It's just a line integral, and at this point, theoretically, you could just go and calculate this yourself, right, for any, any given example. You have to take note that you need, the, um, you need the n to be pointing in the correct direction, of course, all right? So um, ideally, you want your parameterization to be pointing in the correct direction, uh, the same direction as the orientation. All right, however, let's actually write this out. Um, let me actually calculate um, n. What is n, right? So if I, in terms of calculation, I would parameterize this guy, right? So I would have a parameterization r of t, which is x of t, y of t, right? r prime of t is x prime, y prime, right? So what is n? n is equal to t cross k, right? All the way up, um, where was that? up here, n is t cross k, okay? So let's just actually do that computation. i, j, k, t is x prime, y prime, no z direction, because we're in, actually living in the plane, 0, 0, 1. That's gonna be y prime i minus x prime j. And then there's no k term, it's gonna be zero, plus zero k, all right? So that's actually gonna be my normal, okay? So the normal is y prime comma minus x prime. And then of course we want unit. So this has to be a unit normal. All of these are unit normals, right? Because when we measure, we don't want the, the size of the normal to come into this. So over r prime, all right? Okay, r prime, um, let me emphasize, these are all of t, right? Okay, so our integral, our flux integral, if we actually just write it out, that's gonna be integral. Um, if we write it out in terms of t, a to b, f dot this guy up here, y prime of t comma minus x prime of t. Again, we're assuming we have parameterized in the correct direction, r prime of t dt, right? Again, this is our ds. And again, the r primes cancel. So this is just a to b, f dot y prime of t comma minus x prime of t dt. And so, if our f, just like in the previous situation, were f comma g, right? Uh, and again, let me emphasize, this is something that lives in um, uh, the plane, right? We have an entire vector field on the plane. So this would be integral a to b, f dot g, f comma g, y prime comma minus x prime dt, which is a to b, f y prime minus, um, uh, g x prime dt, all right? And oftentimes, so this is um, the calculation you could always do in order to calculate this uh, quantity. But personally, I would always just start all the way up here so I don't have to memorize. Um, for example, here, you'd have to memorize if you want to use this last formula, does the minus sign, is it f y prime minus g x prime? Or is it g x prime minus f y prime? It's easy to forget. So I always start with the f, f uh, dot nds from, in a way, more basic principles. So I have to memorize less. Okay, in any case, um, this leads us to notation. Fy prime is the same as um, f dy dt, and then minus g dx dt dt. 
And again, we could write this as just as a notation, f dy minus g dx. All right. Okay, so in the future, near, very near future, we're going to be working with um, uh, flux and circulation very, very, um, uh, in a very important way. Our major theorems for this uh, class, the end of this class, are all based on, uh, or c all can be thought of as based on the ideas of flux and, uh, and circulation.